Hello. Just waiting for a few more people to hop on to our, our event. My name is Sue Pepin, and I serve as the Director of Health and Clinical Partnerships at Arizona State University. Welcome to all of you to the fourth and final of our biomedical innovation series. Our topic today is creating innovation ecosystems to drive knowledge-led inclusive economic development. I wanna thank the Arizona Biomedical Research Center for sponsoring the series and for ASU Knowledge Enterprise for the work in fostering innovation through research and discovery. This structure today will include a few remarks uh, by Tom Osha. If you have questions, please, at any time, put them into the question chat and we will try to get to them toward the end of our hour together. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Thomas Osha. Tom is the Senior Vice President of Innovation and Economic Development at Wexford Science and Technology. In this role, he guides Wexford's implementation of its knowledge community strategy across its portfolio, working with Wexford's partners including universities, research institutions, entrepreneurs and innovators, growth companies and economic development stakeholders globally to position Wexford's innovation district developments as critical hubs in the regional innovation ecosystem. He currently also serves as the founding board chairman of the Global Institute for Innovation Districts, a global nonprofit organization working toward the growth and advancement of innovation districts. He's a member of the Leadership Council of the Brookings Institute and co-author of the recently released paper, The Evolution of Innovation Districts, A New Geography of Global Innovation, along with Julie Wagner and Bruce Katz. Tom has served as an advisor to the North Atlantic Treaty Organization on global innovation and has acted as an innovation advisor to Global Affairs Canada, helping Canadian companies successfully expand their operations into the United States and assisting US companies in developing Canadian partnerships and markets. Previously, he served as an executive vice president and chief of staff at Broadwing Inc., a telecommunications provider, where he provided executive leadership in the areas of corporate strategy, mergers, and acquisitions. Prior to that, he served as special assistant to the United States Senator Richard Lugar, providing advice on foreign policy issues. He's also provided advice to the Reagan administration and developed a research methodology that has become a standard at um, Congressional Quarterly Magazine. So with that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Tom, for a few comments about. Well, well thank you so much, Sue. It, it's certainly a pleasure to be here. I wish I was uh, there in person, but uh, virtual have to do for today. Um, I'm told that, that we were black on Fridays at, at ASU, so I've got my, uh, my sparky shirt on ready to go. So um, those of you who may not know, Wexford Science and Technology is a developer, but kind of a unique sort of developer in that we only do one thing, and that is the creation of innovation districts at scale. And we only do it with universities, academic medical centers, and major research institutions. And what this really means for us is when you think about innovation, while we're developers, it's never about buildings. It's always about people and ideas. And so when we look at creating an innovation district, what we call knowledge communities, uh, such as uh, what we're creating on the Phoenix Biomedical Campus, we look at what that really means for anchor institutions. What does it enable ASU or the University of Arizona or, or NAU or TGen to be able to accomplish in terms of growing the research and the commercialization, creating experiential learning opportunities for students, bringing corporations closer for engagement and sponsored research. Um, maybe it's impacting the community and improving the human condition or, or shrinking uh, disparities and health outcomes within neighborhoods. And so that's one way that we look at impact is how it really impacts the anchors. The second is what it means for the region. What does it mean to have an innovation district? How does that impact gross regional product, job opportunities, capital investment? And the third, and in many ways, one of the really most important ones is how does it engage a community? 
right? How does it create pathways to jobs? Not just for those who may have a terminal degree or an MD, but those who maybe are coming out of high school or maybe have an associate's degree. What does it mean to create meaningful middle skill jobs and have them be open to, to members of all communities? What does it mean to create a sense of place for innovation? Not a, not a walled kind of campus, but a porous, open, inclusive environment that serves as much for the people of the adjoining neighborhoods as it does for the tenants of the buildings. And then how do these innovation environments magnify and amplify investments so that they really, particularly in today's world, as we move out of this, this COVID-induced recession, how does that they really become um, elements, if you will, of economic recovery. And so that does bring in much of the work that we do as well at the Global Institute. In fact, um, Julie Wagner and I wrote a paper now that's become, I think, a, a bit of the, the uh, uh, standard for economic recovery. It's been adopted in Australia, Israel, Colombia, and parts of it uh, I am told are going to be introduced in the U.S. in the next Congress as a bill to really focus these environments, these innovation districts like the Phoenix Biomedical Campus and even broader within Phoenix as environments where investment really can be amplified to the benefit of all. So um, we continue to work through what this means. Wexford has 15 of these projects around the country with universities that are the peers of, of, of um, NAU or, or U of A or ASU and look forward to continuing to grow. We have one building. That building has a certificate of occupancy. We're working on finishing out the ASU space right now. Though the stay tuned for a grand opening that will probably be sometime uh, in the later part of January next year. But that's just the start. We envision continuing not only to develop buildings, but but to integrate those into what's happening on Roosevelt Row, what's happening in other parts of the campus and in activate that entire part of the downtown area. So that's probably enough of an introduction, Sue, and I'll, uh, I'll cease there and, and let you ask your first question. Well, I wanna build on that. And you talked about that Wexford has 15 communities. Can you give us, can you give us a narrative of one that's farther down the line, so to speak, than ASU that you would, you would highlight as a real success or Tell us about one of them. Sure. So I, I've, I've said if you've, if you've seen one innovation district, you've seen one innovation district. In fact, in some ways, um, they're like wine, right? They, each region is different. Each knowledge community draws from the, the intellectual capital, the innovation, the infrastructure of their university. They pull from the proximate and geographic advantages of their region, and they mix all of that together into a unique kind of environment. But let me describe one, um, and what I'll describe is what's called U City, and that's in Philadelphia. Currently, we've developed over two million square feet, and are simultaneously building another million square feet right now. Um, it is actually the basis of it is Market Street in Philadelphia from about 34th to 38th Street. So this is on the west side of the Schuylkill River, an area known as West Philadelphia. It was an area that was exceptionally depressed. So while it features the campus of the University of Pennsylvania and Drexel, um, the one of the problems was back in the in the 80s, it was it was a very depressed area disenfranchised, riddled with crime. And so it, 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 it was necessary to be able to redevelop this environment, both for the safety and security of its residents, but also to bring jobs and opportunity to that area, right? And to kind of revitalize an area of the city that had been much forgotten. So uh, owing to the great uh, work of Judith Roden, when she was the president of University of Pennsylvania, carried on by their current president, John Fry, the president of Drexel, Children's Hospital, the Wistar Institute, University of the Sciences, all kind of came together and they really created what was called the Science Center. The Science Center was kind of that third place. It wasn't a campus, right? So it wasn't Penn, it wasn't Drexel, it wasn't a hospital system. So it wasn't Penn Presby or it wasn't Children's Hospital. It was a place where innovators could kind of could come, a safe harbor where they could come, work on innovations, integrate with companies, launch new businesses. And it's been exceptionally successful. Most recently, 
some of the successes come specifically in cell and gene therapy. And so uh, Dr. James Wilson, who many see as one of the real fa fathers of cell and gene therapy, had a wonderful lab, but it was on Penn's campus. And deep in Penn's campus, where he was kind of unknown, you really didn't see him, um, you know, Wilson and, and his postdocs would come, go into their lab, think brilliant thoughts, create brilliant things, get in their car and go home. And it really wasn't producing the, the kinds of, of um, impacts that, that Penn wanted it to. And so we worked with Penn to bring Dr. Wilson off of the Penn campus, put him in one of the knowledge community buildings right there on Market Street, so that now you'd see Wilson. You'd see him in the beer garden. You'd see him at the events. You'd run into him or his postdocs in the corner bakery on the ground floor of one of the buildings, or you'd see them at the, at the Hunan Grill. And so all of a sudden now, he became accessible. That accessibility led John Crowley, the CEO of Amicus Pharmaceuticals, to decide he needed to move his R&D out of New Jersey and put it in 3675 Market Street right next door to James Wilson and his labs. And so he took a large footprint um, in that building to bring Amicus and all of their R&D there. By being there, all of a sudden startups wanted to be near Amicus and wanted to be near Wilson. And so Cavaletta and, and Century and, and another of, a number of others have now sprouted up in that same facility. Drexel brought a school of computing and informatics together because certainly um, a lot of cell and gene therapy is also big data science. So the school of informatics came. Well, that attracted a number of digital companies to locate into the building. And the building also features then a ground floor called the Quorum, which is wide open space. It's open to members of the community. It has free Wi-Fi. They can come in and, and they can just lounge right in the area, use the Wi-Fi, have meetings, even if they're not tenants of the building. And so that building is only part of um, seven different buildings that are right there in a tight geography features public plazas, Drexel's new sc the school of medicine buildings going up. We built with Drexel a school for the community. It's a K through eight school um, called the, uh, uh, the Science Leadership Academy of Philadelphia. It's a public school that replaces one that had been taken away back in the uh, late eighties. We replaced some of the street grid to more, more um, opportunistically integrate what's happening there at U City into the neighborhoods of Powelton Village and off of Lancaster Avenue. So there's a number of elements that we brought together. I'll end by saying what we've also put in that building is programmatic activity that is exceptionally inclusive. So one of the challenges to growing cell and gene therapy is making sure you have enough pipeline of workers, right? Who can be bench technicians, who can, who can pipette and set up experiments. Well, to do that, you have to have students who have an interest, right, in STEM disciplines and in life sciences. And in a way, for that interest to take hold, particularly in, in inner school city kids who may not be exposed to these kinds of things, you have to demystify the environment. So we created a whole series of programs to demystify U City, to bring children in to these buildings so that they would understand that, that people who look like them and live where they live have meaningful, important jobs, created a whole series of programs to expose them to careers in life sciences, and then created what's called firsthand, a program that actually is part of the curriculum of middle and high school students in some of the, the challenge schools of West Philadelphia. And they come in as part of their program they put on their goggles, they put on their lab coat, and scientists from the companies in across the U City platform will come in then and teach courses. We run summer camps, and in a lot of ways, it gets these students interested to either continue their education past high school to get that two-year certification, but to consider a job in the uh, in the life sciences in biotechnology where they might not have thought of one previously. It's quite a narrative. There's a lot going on, uh, and, and it isn't all just Wexford. I mean, it's great partners, Penn, 
Drexel, the city of Philadelphia, Ben Franklin Partnership. There's a lot of people who all pull together to make right. this and, and hence with all of those components coming together, really elevated community. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to touch on what you've already brought up, but in your, in your paper, The Evolution of Innovation Districts, you talk about the importance of inclusion within these urban districts, and you started to talk about it. I wonder if you would talk to us more about the steps that can be taken to really drive that. Sure. So when we wrote The Evolution, so The Evolution of Innovation Districts was actually a follow-up to a paper that Bruce and Julie wrote called the rise of innovation districts. And we wrote evolution five years later and we wanted to see what had really changed, right? The, the, the rise of innovation districts kind of named and framed what they were. They laid out these, these physically, you know, um, identifiable hyper-connected places that featured um, university research, entrepreneurial activity, corporate engagement. And, and so we'd seen how they had evolved. And one of the things that we had seen across the world was really this need for these to be more inclusive. And that a number of districts were starting to recognize, particularly life sciences districts, that fully 25 to 40% of the jobs don't require a four-year degree. And so if you have these jobs not requiring a four-year degree, how do you create the training programs to be able to include others in those jobs. Lab Force that CEI is doing that we'll be bringing to the Wexford building right there on the Phoenix Biomedical Campus is a perfect example of that, of one of those kinds of programs. And so what we were really finding was we do a lot of work in West Baltimore, West Philadelphia, South side of Chicago, Lambert's Point in Norfolk, Virginia, Overtown in Miami. And these are traditionally proud, yet often disenfranchised, many times minority communities that have been cut off from access to traditional jobs. And so as we've brought the knowledge communities into these environments, we've paid particular attention to how do you include, right? How are we able to create programs that like recently, uh, a few weeks ago, in Baltimore, we held a program, it seems really simple, but it's trick-or-treating for kids, right? You can imagine in West Baltimore, on the corners that used to feature drug activity, there are no safe places to trick-or-treat. And so what we've done is we bring students in from the three schools that happen to be around the what's called the University of Maryland Biopark. We bring them in to trick-or-treat the building. They go through the building, they're able to meet people, right, who, who, who have their background as well. They're able to see what a, what a laboratory looks like. They're able to hear about what these kinds of companies do. And while this year trick-or-treating was a little different, they couldn't go up into the offices and the labs, they were still able to come into the building and appropriately social distance in our large conferencing center and still do a bit of trick-or-treating. But it demystifies the environment so that the next time they walk past the building, or their parent walks past the building, they know what goes on inside. And that building is seen as a contributor to the fabric of the environment. We have a parking garage down the street from it that had some open bays on the ground floor. And so we decided one of them needed to be a community center. There was no community center in West Baltimore. This gave us an opportunity to, to let the community envision a space they needed it to be. And there's times I walk by in the morning, you'll see the lady sewing circle there at 10 o'clock in the morning. At four o'clock in the afternoon, you'll see a number of young children in there doing homework or going through an after school program. And, and the success of that program, the success of what they were able to create in that space, got the city council to then give them enough money to buy a building that was there in the community and now have a much larger center. And so in some ways we see ourselves maybe as a catalyst or as a, as a cedar of these kinds of in, environments. Um, in Miami, it's working with Lindsay Hopkins, which happens to be a technical a vocational school right next door to be able to create internships with many of the companies next door in what's called Converge Miami. Um, in West Philadelphia, it's also plugging into the West Philadelphia Skills Initiative, which is actually um, a program that has does everything from landscaping to laundry. Many times it's the hardest core 
most unemployable. Many of them are, are coming out of incarceration, but it teaches us kinds of job skills that prevents recidivism and enables, again, the, the opportunities that we kind of create by aggregating this density of uses and companies and activity to be able to be a real generator of jobs for many. And so that, that's one way that we've kind of looked at it is how can you create this environment for inclusion? The other way is how can you use the various companies that happen to be within these environments to be able to create opportunities for that both increase economic mobility um, as well as solve problems. And so one of the, one of the good examples, this is an example out of Boston, was um, there's a number of companies there, one company in particular, and I'm sorry, it was out of Miami. Um, we ran a hackathon for, for companies in Miami. They all came together and one of the winning ones had created an app for the phone. And the app was around finding the cheapest prescription price for a drug within the neighborhoods of, of Little Havana and Overtown and some of the inner city neighborhoods of Miami. Because the problem could be that you would leave your house and you would go a mile down the street and you'd be able to pick up a prescription that might cost $60. Had you known to go a quarter mile the other direction, you might be able to pick that prescription up for $12, right? And so that information hadn't always been available to people. And so one of the winning companies had created this app on a phone into which somebody could plug their address and their prescription, and it would survey all of the um, pharmacies within a, a certain uh, uh, radius and, and be able to give them the right price. And so it, it's interesting, you can have social impact in addition to economic mobility. And, and we never forget that we're here because of the neighborhoods and we're in the neighborhoods give enormous flavor to these uh, buildings. They, the days of universities kind of being behind their ivory walls and, and being walled off are, are over. And, and you look at the moves that, that President Crow has made at ASU. You look at what's happened up at NAU un, under uh, Dr. Chang, and you certainly look at what uh, the University of Arizona has done both in, in Tucson and in Phoenix. Um, and you see this kind of desire to be a part of the community. And then certainly what's happening at Maricopa Community College and, and places like CEI and Lab Force are getting right down to meeting the community where the community's at and training them for the jobs that are coming in, the, in this kind of next decade of, of, of technology. Yeah, yeah, some wonderful stories of what's going on. You know, you, to follow up on that, you also talk about in the paper how innovation districts are, are the physical manifestations of really a changing time where inherent characteristics of a city enable heightened connectivity and knowledge exchange. Can you talk about both the place-based strengths and challenges of doing this work successfully on, on any campus, but potentially common on in Phoenix? Sure, so I, it's a great question. Um, in a number of ways we've seen over the last let's say 10 years, a, a real change in this, right? And so it used to be that when one was looking at creating a, a, a science park or a research park, they were looking suburban, right? Let's go out where land is, is infinite and, and not very costly, and, and we have lots of it. And so you look at the Research Triangle Park that was held up as really one of the standards for many years. And you look at Research Triangle Park and it's, 2,000 acres, maybe even more, um, of two-story buildings set back 100 feet from the street, many of them behind fences, right? No walkability, no, it's a park. Um, and so if you want to get a cup of coffee, you want to get lunch, you want to have a pint after work, you get in a car and you go someplace. Um, the buildings are all set great distances from one another. So what you have is this environment that's homogeneous, disaggregated, automotive dependent, and really not collaborative, right? There's great companies in, in RTP. It's, this isn't a judgment against the companies. So now you fast forward to, to really, um, a few years ago when Wexford and, and, and a couple of others began to see that 
really what this could be is, is urban and, and bringing these closer, not to the institutions and also closer to the, the cities. And so you started to see Philadelphia, which is urban, St. Louis in the central West End, um, Miami next to its medical district, Winston-Salem, a, a third tier city using the abandoned tobacco where, factory and warehouses of RJ Reynolds, which just sat right there next to downtown. And, and being able now to create density, walkability and bikeability, transit connection in some cases, and really being able to create this environment that brought amenities as well. So it both leveraged amenities, uh, of the existing urban fabric. Now I have somewhere I can walk to go grab a bite, to go have a drink, to go meet somebody, but then also bringing additional amenities, parks, public plazas, integrating those perhaps into existing fabrics and frameworks. And, and so it really brought a different environment because it now started to blend housing, hotel, retail, right? Fitness and other amenities in with the research and the development and the corporate activity. And so really people began to brand out the live, work, play, learn environment. And so if you kind of think about now what's happening, particularly think about the, the Phoenix biomedical campus, you are sitting right in downtown Phoenix. You're only a few blocks off of Central Avenue and the light rail, right? There's a reason why we purposely put our building, the, the first building, which is 850 North 5th Street, while we put that one on the north end of the site and not the south end, because it was right next to Roosevelt Row. Now we can leverage the, the excitement of, of First Fridays when we get back to excitement around First Fridays, the, the opportunity of the, the coffee shops and the bars and the restaurants and the, and the art and the activation of Roosevelt Row and that, that um, uh, proximity also to the Evans Churchill neighborhoods. So you have a good walkability, you have a good grid structure. We're, we're going to slow down Fifth Street enough, it's going to become a real pedestrian way, right? And, that's, and then that will connect into the next buildings that we do. And so you do have this live, work, play, learn, we call it discover, heal environment as well. And if you look at the demographics of millennials and Generation Z, um, they're looking for, you know, these kinds of environments. They don't want, in many cases, a car. Car ownership among, you know, 20 18 to 25 year olds is at historic lows, as, as is the holding of driver's licenses in general. So this kind of highly activated environment becomes really important. Um, and this activated environment because of its density allows you to uh, uh, apply capital, apply investments and be able to amplify those greatly. Not just if I were going to put a new um, amenity in the Research Triangle Park, it sits way, you know, it sits 15, 20 minutes from everybody else. Nobody can share in that if I'm going to put a, a new plaza in or if I'm going to do something unique. Um, Visha, which is one of the top 10 restaurants according to USA Today, we put it in St. Louis, right there in Cortex. It's become a destination for everybody, not just the tenants, not just the Central West End, which is, which is the area it's in, but people come from all around for it. If I would have put that out in, in, uh, um, in Creve Core or further out, you know what, it, it's, it's disaggregated from everything else that's going on. So it's just kind of leveraging potential. You're gonna see that even more, particularly because what that's going to be able to do, and this is maybe a, a little bit of a, a sneak preview of the next paper that Julie Wagner and, and Bruce Katz and I are working on um, that, that might be called something like the imperative of innovation districts, that is gonna be able to enable you to support a lot more minority businesses as well, right? So to be able to be in this urban fabric, to be able to create all sorts of accelerators and opportunities for Black and Brown and Latino X and, and, and First Nations and, and Indigenous peoples kind of businesses, that kind of inclusion really requires some density. 
the other element of that is when you don't have density, you have seven hour retail, right? It's there for breakfast, it's there for lunch, everybody goes away. Where you do have density, you do have housing within a seven or 10 minute walk, then you have 17 hour retail, right? You have an activated environment that, that goes beyond just the time that people are there sitting in their offices. Well, let's, let's go further on that activated environment and, and talk about sort of the cross institution relationships. As, we, as we've been talking about, unlike research parks, innovation districts embrace attributes of density and proximity to really allow and facilitate collaborative, you know, open innovation. While infrastructure like the Wexford Center is critical, it's not enough to simply put people near each other or in a building together. Can you describe and talk to us about the social networking strategies or social engineering that's needed to facilitate effective communication and collaboration across the various stakeholders, institutions, and sectors? Well, Sue, that sounds exactly like a question by somebody who has seen um, researchers sitting in their office do, diligently doing research. And uh, yes, so if left to their own devices, people will tend to stay in their offices, stay in their labs, head down doing work, a a absolutely. Um, and so it does take some curation, right? Some intervention to get, to get them out of those offices. But once you start getting them out, then a whole lot of interesting things happen. So one of the things that is most important to, to our whole platform is programmatic activity, right? It, so both design of the buildings for accidental and serendipitous collisions, as well as design of the buildings for intentional programmatic activity in common spaces and public plazas. So one of the things, and, you, and you've seen a lot of this, I think one of the first studies was done by, I wanna say Bell Labs in the, in the early 70s, I was 74. It really looked at collaboration and how collaboration falls off, right? Uh, distance of corridor, office to office, floor to floor, building to building. And if you need to be um, more than about a 10 minute walk, then you might, you, you, you might as well get on an airplane and fly somewhere, right? And so that, that's really kind of how people look at it. And so this ability to have this strong density is important but then bringing people out of these labs, bringing people from these various environments and, and bringing them together allows you now to take a, a different approach to innovation. So, so in a lot of cases, people thought innovation was somebody in their laboratory, right? With some postdocs around them looking for that discovery. What we're really finding more these days is more of a wolf pack mentality. It's not one person working on a discovery, right? It might be a data scientist, it might be an epidemiologist, it could be an anthropologist, maybe there's a tinkerer in, in, involved, maybe there's an English major, right? It, 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 it's this ability to bring multiple perspectives and diverse viewpoints onto a problem. So that requires an environment that has art and music and science, right, all together. And so designing the floors in such a way that people are kind of forced to bump into one another um, around coffee pots, common kitchens, on stairwells, those kinds of environments work, work well. I think of a building actually in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, that's on the on the what's called Technology Square, just off the Georgia Tech campus. The mm -hmm. building features a 17-story spiral staircase. is is one of the wow. the most interesting things you've ever seen. And it goes up the building, and on each floor there's a little, uh, almost like a little plaza. Mm -hmm. You come off the spiral staircase. Here's a plaza. Each floor's plaza is entirely different and becomes the gap. Some have swing sets, you know, others have bean bags, some have, uh, have artificial turf and putting greens, others have just apple crate boxes. Each one's unique and starts to become a gathering point, 
right? And so that's common stairwells a gathering point. And then you start gathering and bumping into different people in this building. It's a huge building um, as you come down that stairwell. So that becomes kind of interesting. We created in, in Winston-Salem, Bailey Park. We created a park that tied together five buildings. And that park has become the front lawn for the community. Movies at midnight. It, it, it hosts the film festival called the River Run Film Festival. Holds one of only two road, road cycling um, events in the United States that's sanctioned by UCI. Um, that's the start finish line. To it. It's really become the community's front lawn. But at the same time, then, we run all sorts of other programming that pulls people out of their offices. One of the ones we ran was called Merge. And it brought together two different viewpoints. So one day I was at one of the merges, and that one happened to be taking a look at the largest organ in the body from two different viewpoints. So obviously that's the skin, right? And so what they had was a dermatologist, right? So you have a dermatologist from Wake Forest Baptist Health who had invited all of her dermatology clients, her colleagues, everybody who works with her. So there's about 200 people, right? And you can imagine dermatology um, uh, thought leaders, folks all coming, here they are. Now, who else deals with skin a lot as an open canvas? Tattoo artists, right? So here's a tattoo artist. And he brought all of his friends and his clients and his colleagues. So you can imagine the mixing of those two groups of people who probably would never under other circumstances run into one another. But they got to talking about things and, and the next thing you know, a new idea has, has come up. And I, rem I remember one day we ran a program uh, called Unwind. It was just a wine program in Norfolk, Virginia. And, and there were three people that had kind of come together. One of them happened to be the, the, uh, uh, the uh, audio engineer for Elton John. And so this was the guy that set up all the Elton John concerts, engineered all the audio. And he was talking to the chief scientific officer of NATO, and he was talking to one of the world's greatest researchers in bioelectrics. And what the three of them were talking about was the use of acoustical waves to heal back issues. And, and, and the guy who is not a scientist, as you can imagine, was talking about how he discovered this because his back always hurt, you know, you're, is, a, is a roadie, right? Um, and he would always stand in front of the biggest speaker during sound check because it made his back feel better to feel that big bass booming out from so the speaker speaker. through his back, right? These people would never meet under other circumstances. So you have this intentional line of programmatic activity that seeks to bring people out. And then finally, we run what we call our innovation network, which is an intentional thing where we make connections. Um, Microsoft was in, in St. Louis and was doing some incredible stuff and wanted to meet some other universities. And so we were able to take them to Duke and to Miami and to Brown and to other places and so that they could meet specific scientists doing things that they were interested in. So there's a lot of that, I think, that already happens. I mean, I, I know that there's collaborations that, that are happening between NAU and, and, and UA and ASU at the PI level. What we do then is we curate an environment that brings in entrepreneurs, brings in artists, brings in companies, thought leaders, the, the, the business and government officials, and mixes all of that as kind of a hub of innovation. Well, and, and you've talked about the importance of the physical space to have people bump into each other, but also to want to convene and slow down mm -hmm. for a moment outside of their you know, little spaces and also the programming necessary. How important is it for you know, buildings you develop to have an ethos to rally around so that researchers, the cities, the companies um, rally? Kind of, you mean like a differentiation? A differentiation, a purpose? Mm -hmm. so, so it's interesting. That's one of the, that's kind of one of the debates that, that, se that seems to occur uh, across the world is, do, do you create a comparative differentiation 
that is so narrow, like we're going to do cell and gene therapy, like you would, like, like I described in Philadelphia, or are you more broad based, like what you might see in Cortex in St. Louis, where you'll see research in food science, you'll see Uber doing their research, Square is there doing research, Enterprise Rent-A-Car, Aeon's doing research in insurance, the National Geospatial Agency. So a real broad range, what everyone is doing is innovative stuff, but maybe in an entirely uh, 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 dissimilar set. And so I think one of the things that, one of the things that is important is probably less the, the differentiated science, although not everybody can be a, a, a bioscience campus, right? So you say there's lots of bioscience going on in the world, right? Lots of people have bioscience areas. So what makes you special? Why should you be in Phoenix versus being in, in San Diego or Austin, Texas or Cambridge or somewhere else? And so you do set that kind of differentiation. That is important to being able to line up your intellectual capital, your infrastructure, the assets that make that unique. But then kind of having a purpose in terms of commercialization, we're looking to improve the human condition by bringing things out of the laboratory and putting them into the hands of man, right? And so those kinds of environments are important. So you look at somewhere like, um, well, you look at somewhere like Phoenix or, or you know, in, in Phoenix, you guys are looking at how can we, right? Therapeutic genomics, what are we able to do um, in a, a whole broad range of things, but they're all around really impacting people, right? How do we impact people? How do we shrink disparities? How do we measure population outcomes? How do we have a, you know, some inclusive impacts? So, so that is kind of a purpose-driven environment. I, I, I look at somewhere like Cleveland, where, you know, in Cleveland, it has a manufacturing base, but it has a lot of industrial design. And so they focus on usability, right? And, and, and how do we test, right? Whether, whether things are tolerable, usable, right? Acceptable. And so they kind of have a different purpose into, into what they do. Um, I think it's important to rally around these environments, which is also why our inclusion comes in as even more important um, is, by being inclusive, you're really, it's about everybody sharing in the opportunity, right? And everybody being able to, to economic mobility, the beauty of it is it impacts everybody, right? And so I, I think it's important, it's a tough question, I'm struggling with it a bit, um, just because I've, 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 we've turned it over in so many places, this, I, I will tell you, the United States is way ahead of the rest of the world. Interesting. Yep. I, uh, when I look at what's going on in 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 Beersheba, in Israel, in Sheffield, in the UK, in Mechelen, um, the, the, nobody is where where the U.S. is in terms of thinking through kind of inclusion, curation, and these kinds of pathways. I'm gonna say I'm not surprised we're ahead. I've got some really excellent questions from oh. our participants. One from uh, one of our professors at ASU, and it's getting kind of specific about Phoenix. While ASU has been number one in innovation for several years now, Phoenix startup community is often called, you know, a young market. Where do you think Wexford will need to emphasize or what um, or to create a vibrant knowledge community downtown? And also given how distributed expertise is across the valley, that Wexford downtown will be able to create the critical mass like more established cities such as Philly, Baltimore, Miami? Wow, that's a great question. Um, well, let me, let, me, uh, let me answer that in two parts. Okay. So, so one is you're right, ASU, number one in innovation, six years in a row, right, has a great reputation. Um, entrepreneurial community, young. And, so one of the advantages, and, and I think one of those, one of the advantages, um, ASU's innovation in a lot of cases has been inward facing, right? Innovations as an institution, right? That make ASU a better ASU, a, a bigger quality kind of next generation research university. 
in fact, I, I was I was um, chatting with with Michelle before we got on that I, I was speaking with the provost at another university. I was describing ASU's testing. My daughter, who's who's a first year at ASU, is going to be tested Monday before she gets on a plane to come home for Thanksgiving. And he went, "Why are those guys always ahead of everybody else? They always make it look so easy." And, and those kinds of innovations are are one of the reasons why ASU is where it is. Now this opportunity to really um, reinvigorate the biomedical campus allows that innovation now to also be outward facing. And so one of the advantages, I think, and, and, and I know that this is in, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but I know this is in Dave Crater's thinking as the leader of the, the new leader of the biomedical campus is how does this environment become the front door you know, for three great universities, right? Um, ASU, NAU, and U of A, a, a great private research institution in TGen, and a wonderful community college in, in what's happening there. And so here's this front door now that as an entrepreneur, I can come and locate and be able now to, to get access to, and maybe even be shepherded to, you know, some large, complex, maybe intimidating environments. So I think that's one of them. Um, you know, the, the, the advances that have been made in knowledge enterprise, right, over the last several years and the success that's happening in places like Skysong. Um, I think plugging those opportunities and creating programmatic activity that, that, you know, that links Skysong and what's happening downtown together, make sure that the the, the knowledge enterprise, and I think there is an innovation lab of knowledge enterprise coming to the downtown building. I think that's important because that engages entrepreneurs. I think traditionally entrepreneurs haven't really, they, they, they've looked a little bit farther west than Phoenix and thought everything was there. I think COVID is accelerating some trends that were causing people to look at other cities. Phoenix is a big beneficiary of that. Good cost of living, good business climate, wonderful universities, but I, I can have a different kind of life here and maybe a life that's a little easier than quarantining in an 800 square foot apartment. And so I, I think it's gonna get on the radar more. And I think this aggregation of all of these elements now with strong leadership that's, that's gonna look at them as, as a cohesive unit. Um, I think that's one huge, huge key. And then the second key about kind of this creation of critical mass, I think really does come programmatically. You know, how do we bring programs like the venture cat, you know, the Global Venture Cafe um, to Phoenix in such a way that while they're wonderful centers of gravity, right? They're centers of gravity in Mesa and Chandler and Tempe and Phoenix and, and, and you know, even spread across the valley, programmatic activity can be a fabric that weaves all of that together. And so I think having a couple of nodes and particularly a heart of innovation, which I look at as being the, the, the Phoenix Biomedical Campus, I think that's one of the ways that, that we're gonna be able to create a little bit more of this is intentionally bringing people together. It's gonna to take time. Um, it's gonna take everybody kind of pulling in that same direction, but I sense that there's that desire out there. You know, related to this, another question from our participants, one of our Health Future Council members, um, what success have you had or, or, or these areas had in attracting venture capital investors to the projects? So that's, that's a wonderful question. Some, some people look at uh, money as being the lifeline of entrepreneurism. I tend to say that talent is the, is the currency of innovation and money follows talent. But it's an excellent question because what it means is you have to have the right talent in place and then money will take a look. So Philadelphia is a perfect example, right? Because James Wilson is in Philadelphia, venture capital firms are coming to Philadelphia to look at what he's doing. And while they're looking at what he's doing, they're looking at what Caballet is doing. They're looking at what Spark's doing. They're looking at what exact sciences is doing. They're looking at others. So it tends to start slowly and then the flywheel kind of goes. Now, Philadelphia has a strong venture capital set. Miami started off slow, but Dr. Josh Hare, who's one of the most prolific 
um, inventors at, at UM was able to get somebody to come down. And, and Wexford holds symposiums where VCs kind of come and, and can see what's going on um, at a university. VC started looking at what Josh Hare was doing. Then they looked over at, at uh, what was happening with, with just somebody named, named Manny Medina and what he was doing in telecom. And next thing you know, this the, the uh, Miami being the, what some people say the northernmost um, country in Latin America started to create then this opportunity for Latin American VCs to come up and to look at companies that they could fund and then that perhaps could create relationships with companies in Latin America. And so that was a, an interesting pocket of VC. Sacramento, because of its proximity to San Francisco, there you get VCs in food science that are looking at what's happening at the Mondavi Center and what's happening um, in, in some of the other things that they have going on. So you you get a lot of that going in Phoenix. Um, there's not a lot of VC yet. I do believe that what we're going to start to see is we're going to start to see VCs out of California looking a little bit broader, right? There's, there is plenty of VC in California, but there's usually, there's not much new money moving into California. There's lots of existing money, but new money is kind of looking at some other ideas in some other places, both as a hedge of financially for what's going on, as well as they're starting to see that there's a lot of other interesting activity. So I think as people are, are coming along, they're gonna, whether it's interesting technologies that, that Dr. Zenherson, you know, is coming out of his lab or something that's coming out of TGen, I think you're gonna see some VCs start to poke in more, particularly since it's again, starting to be an aggregated environment that VCs, by and large are lazy. They, they want everything close. That's why they're aggregated in a few places. But if they have something worth going to see, then they're gonna make that trip worthwhile. And then once they go somewhere, they're gonna find a lot of people to see in that, in that place as well. And we've seen that in quite a, quite a bit of places. And then, and then we'll start to see them decide they're gonna start coming two days a week, right? And then it leads to an office. Before you know it, you have one or two people in that environment. Yeah, and, and you talked about have the talent and ideas and the, the dollars will follow. What things have you found successful? And I'm gonna ask specifically, what things are is Wexford are you doing to um, increase the diversity? Often in these things we're talking about, it's pretty uh, male dominated. And how are, we, how are you fostering both women and minorities in these spaces? Sure, so uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful question. So. In a number of our projects, we actually have specific programs, right? Women engineers, women entrepreneurs. We run a program in Winston-Salem called Access that is specifically for minority entrepreneurs. In Chicago, in a project that we'll be doing with the University of Chicago, we're actually, we're setting aside space. I apologize for the dogs. And we're, setting aside, we're setting aside space for black entrepreneurs in um, partnership with a, a group called Black Tech Mecca and, uh, and Blue 1427. In Miami, we have programs for minority entrepreneurs. In Philadelphia, we run some programs. First Hand is one of them. We run a number of other programs as well. So we look for partners that we can work with to create these pathways, to create this programmatic activity. If it's there, we support financially. We give it a place to be if it needs it. If it's not there, we're willing to invest to help create. And then as a company ourselves, we've created a number of internship programs. We've tried to be more diverse in our own hiring. We've supported programs in real estate and development at a number of schools that's making it so that there are more um, minorities that are actually choosing real estate development as a career path. So that gives us a better better talent pool that's going to be coming in the future. But we are, we are exceptionally committed to this. And I know I've already been talking to some community groups in Phoenix about making sure that as this project goes along that those kind of opportunities will be there too. Yeah, your dogs are cheering that answer above others because you're they offering are. to support women and, and minorities. So they're cheering the UPS man who just came. Well, the no, they're cheering your answer. 
Um, we have time for one more question, and I, I kind of want to put you on the spot a little bit in helping a problem that we're struggling with. You know, the Phoenix Biomedical Campus, as it's currently named, is undertaking a comprehensive local and national perception study because there's a debate on whether or not we are branded appropriately and whether what the name should be. What are your thoughts or what advice can you give us? So that's a, that is a tough one. I'm going through a couple of those exercises right now in a couple of other, a couple of other cities. And it's always a balancing act, right? Some want it to be place-based to actually have the name Phoenix in it, right? You could, you could see that if you just called it, you know, the innovation campus, well, that could be anywhere, right? And so Phoenix does lend a, a place modifier. City of Phoenix has been a great partner in all of this. And so that, that's important. And, and Phoenix says things that has, has a great reputation. And so it lends some brand credibility to it. Biomedical it might be limiting, right? You might decide that where, where we look at where life sciences is going these days, that brings in tech, that brings in engineering, brings in design thinking. And so maybe there's a, a more inclusive um, modifier than that. And so one of the things that at least we've kind of looked for it, when we do these is, is it authentic to the place, right? Is, 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 is it something that goes to your history, goes to, to um, uh, uh, some of your, your, your unique economic development points? Is it descriptive enough that it doesn't sound like it could be sitting anywhere, right? Um, in you can get twenty people around the table, and there'll be twenty different ideas. So, in a in a way, what's more important is how you communicate, right? What that is, what's your narrative about whatever you call it, whether it's PBC or whether it turns out to be something. Um, that branches off of that. How are you communicating that story in such a way that it isn't about the buildings, right? It's really about the people and ideas that are within those buildings and the impact that that environment creates for others. That's good advice. You know, in our last two minutes, Tom, um, I guess I would say now that you've invested in, in, in Phoenix, in the Wexford building, what, what has surprised you? What have you learned that surprised you or what parting advice do you wanna give us? I think one of, the, one of the, I don't know that it's been a surprise. I think it's been a confirmation is how in sync everybody is, right? So, so, so the universities, the community college, the businesses, the city, right, thought leaders, the Flynn Foundation, everybody understands, is committed to, and is rowing in the same direction. That's not true in a lot of cities, right? In a lot of cities, there, there's all sorts of competing interests. There's, there's different priorities. Some, in some places, there's, there's zero interest in innovation whatsoever. Um, and, and you know, no, no interest in, in, in participation in that by, by minorities and others. Where in Phoenix, everybody seems to believe that the Phoenix Biomedical Campus is important, right? And so, so everybody's pulling in the same direction. That cannot be understated because when you're looking at a, a, a tier two city, and, and, and by tier two, I only mean not one of the gateway markets for life sciences, Everybody's got to be pulling in that in that same direction. You've got to take the friction out of the system. You've got to make it easier because that's one of the arguments. It can't just be we're more affordable, right? We're more affordable and we have fewer taxes in Seattle or San Francisco. That's true and that's good, but that's not enough. The environment has to be more creative and more productive. And how do you do that? Well, you do that by having more inclusion and diversity of thoughts and ideas. You take the friction out of the system and being able to navigate large, complex tier one research universities, right? As an entrepreneur, it's wonderful if I can come and I can use some core labs and facilities, 
right? That, that I might never be able to afford. And so that becomes important. I can make connections, right? Across the valley, right? With, with, with other entrepreneurs, be they in my space or a different space. So all of those elements really work together in creating this kind of, of robust environment. We found it in Phoenix in, in, in a way that we're, we're thrilled and, and we wanna fill this building and, and we're already designing the next one and, and are excited by, by the future, not only of the biomedical campus, but the future of the city and the valley. So I, I really appreciate this opportunity to, if nothing else, hopefully my passion and excitement for this will come through. Well, it certainly comes through, Tom. We can't thank you enough for sharing your time with us, for talking to us today. And to all the participants, thank you so much. You know, all of these um, conversations were recorded and are, will be available if you happen to have missed one or you want to pass them along. Again, thank you, Tom. Everyone stay well and um, appreciate your participation. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. I appreciate it.